Hey, everyone. We would like to thank everyone for joining us today to review and discuss this groundbreaking research. My name is Angie Stratman. I'm the sales development manager here at The Mom Project, and I'm stepping in for Christina Cartwright this afternoon, who was unable to make it. So uh, first, a few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded, so it'll be sent out with the 2022 Talent Trends Work Labs report this, uh, after this event. So be on the lookout for that in your inbox. And then also myself and these three wonderful panelists will be sticking around afterwards and hosting a Q&A in the sessions tab. So after we're done here, if you want to ask more questions, you just want to visit, jump on over to the sessions portions of the event platform and chat with us. So, all right, I'd love to first start by introducing Victoria Pua. She is a talent success partner here at The Mom Project. Victoria has been with TMP for not quite a year yet, but has made such an impact and has been such an incredible asset to TMP talent recruiting team. Victoria has been a part of the recruiting world for almost 10 years with a background in startups, tech, and corporate Fortune 100 companies. So welcome, Victoria. And next, I'd love to introduce our Work Labs team. Work Labs is the research and insights division of the MOM Project. And I'm honored to introduce Dr. Pam Cohen, the Chief Research and Analytics Officer at TMP and Work Labs. And Abby Haynes is the Senior Manager of Research here today. So welcome, ladies. Would you both mind by starting by telling us a bit about your background and about Work Labs and the report we're going to be talking about today? Sure. Andy, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, my background is in social psychology and behavioral economics and really finding ways to measure intangible things that are critical to corporations in terms of their bottom line, but are sometimes elusive to measurement. Uh, I've been with the MOM Project since its inception about five years ago, where we were a team of about five people, and we've now grown to over 300 people. And as we've grown, MOM Project has continued to prioritize investing in research um, and opportunities to help organizations and uh, um, the talent that support them. And we now have an extremely robust research team as well. Uh, let me let Abby Haynes go ahead and introduce herself as well. Awesome. Thanks, Pam. I'm really happy to be here with you all. Um, Abby Haynes, Senior Manager of Research. I've been with the MOM Project and Work Labs now for a little over two years. Started right before the pandemic and really since then, we've been on the ground doing research about moms and work, really critical workplace topics to, to provide some key critical insights. So happy to share out some of those with you all today. Yeah, thank you guys so much. So we are certainly glad that so much of that research has been able to shine a light on how moms have been disproportionately impacted during this time. Pam, would you mind speaking a bit more about Work Labs and its research approach? Of course. Work Lab really specializes in collecting and integrating qualitative and quantitative methodologies. We develop predictive models that yield really prescriptive and actionable results. We advise companies on topics ranging from flexible work structures, best in class parental leave policies, and, and certainly how to foster more diverse and inclusive workplaces. And not only that, but we also devote a, a large amount of our time specializing in thought leadership, looking for weak signals on the radar screen that really make a sizable impact for organizations if they focus on those things and excellent employee experiences. Uh, work Labs and Mom Project's interest in conducting this kind of research is really simple. We're interested in cultivating people-centric workplaces um, and offering people the best opportunities for work and helping organizations to prioritize and invest in employee experiences. That's awesome, Pam. So, you know, Abby, Pam, it's my understanding that what we're hearing from both of you today is research that your team's collected over the course of two years is really allowing us to see a pretty clear picture of not just what moms are looking for, but what talent is wanting from work. So can we begin with you guys walking us through, you know, what the process looked like in motivating this piece and, and why now? Why is it so relevant? Yeah, happy to start uh, tackling that one, Angie. Um, really amidst the great resignation, um, like the current landscape right now, we thought it was important to put out this research piece where we do a bit of reflection looking back at the two years of research that we've collected because 
in doing so, at the end of 2020, we fielded this survey, like our, what we called our silver linings study, where we looked at, um, you know, what were some of those silver linings that moms were experiencing amidst the pandemic. And one of those key findings that we, we saw was 88% had gained clarity for what they wanted in a future employer. And 90% reported that change to more of a remote first environment as being, you know, a really positive experience. So like looking at those two findings together, for us, it's not all that surprising that we're seeing what we're seeing in the marketplace today, right? Where um, moms now have kind of this newfound time with childcare coming back, you know, and being accessible again, kids being back in school, that they're being really, you know, like um, really detailed in what they're looking for in an organization. They're now starting to really determine what they want and what they need out of a future workplace. And a lot of that has been informed by the last two years of work. Um, so, so in doing so, we're just looking back at, at the last two years of research that we've conducted from Work Labs to just paint this picture of, of what's driving moms to, to certain companies and what they're really looking for. So, you know, with all of that being said, I, we thought that the best way to structure our conversation is, you know, landing on really di diving into what Work Labs has determined to be the key, the four key drivers to attracting mom talent and, and what seems to really matter and impact moms. So we've got a really great mix of talent and organizations online with us today. So we want to make sure we're sharing insights that resonate really with, you know, both sides of the aisle here and driving really into our first driver, which is flexibility. You know, this is something that the mom project and work labs have always thought as being absolutely crucial. And now we've been through two years, right? We've been through two years of the pandemic, managing virtual schooling, remote, having kids at home. So talk to us about what flexibility means for, for moms and, and why it's so important in, in 2022, Pam. Sure, absolutely. You know, the definition of flexibility has really shifted over time. One thing has remained consistent though, and that is while flexibility is critical, flexibility needs to be accompanied by respect for flexibility. In the absence of that, you can have flexibility of many types, uh, but if you aren't allowing people to have flexibility and also get ahead, do plum assignments um, and support them in terms of their family and their lives outside work, then really that falls to the wayside. Um, but, but flexibility itself in terms of the definitions has shifted a bit. Really at the end of 2020, about 90% of moms talked about the shift to remote work as being positive um, and that they were more de than ever determined to continue to work remote in the future in some ways as, as they got a taste of what it was like to work remote and to have more opportunities at home, they really wanted to stick with that. And of course, organizations at the same time were seeing that that was actually a possibility where a lot of times uh, bricks and mortar companies in particular were saying, we can't do that. Now we're in a space where we tend to think about flexibility as only being remote work, but it's really a lot more than that. Where remote work is certainly a component, most definitely. But it's also felt through, again, manager support for unique flexibility needs. In other words, it may change week to week, day to day, but knowing what um, employees need and supporting that and perhaps doing some sort of trade-off within the organization can really be helpful. And then there's organizational support for unique flexibility needs. Um, executives, as well as managers, need to understand the whole organization, who needs to be on site when, what needs to get done when, and then working around that. Uh, is widespread acceptance to working the hours needed to get the job done without there being set hours continues to grow. That's really where we'll see the most success. In other words, can I get the work done that I need to do in 30 hours as opposed to 40? There's no magic number in terms of it being 40 hours. If somebody does quality work in less time, that can be really helpful and go a long way to helping people maintain flexible hours. Some people just want to work flexible hours during throughout the day. Um, they need to be available when they're needed, but they also want to have time at home for pickups, maybe for drop-offs, for, for doing certain things. They're willing to put in the hours, but they need it to be flexible around their schedule. Um, and then when remote work is on the table, there's a strong desire by moms to see those clear investments by organizations into the experiences of their employees. 
And, you know, again, we can't overemphasize the idea that if there's respect for flexibility and unique needs, then we're going to see success in that. I love that. I love that idea of unique flexibility. I know, you know, being a mom myself, being able to drop her off and pick her up from daycare is so helpful in, in our household. So uh, yeah, it's huge. I, um, I love that, Pam. So Victoria, on our call today, we've, we've got some existing organizations that are hiring through TMP currently. We also have some prospective employers um, that, are, that are looking to partner with us. So what does an organization's talent, how does an organization's talent pool expand when flexibility is offered? Um, I think it expands really um, by having more talent apply, having more talent be interested in the company and really inviting folks who could not and um, we're not able to, excuse me, um, come into an office, I think really expands the talent pool. That's, no, that's that's so true. And it, and it kind of brings us to, to this last thing that I want to touch on, which is many organizations in the last month even have announced this big return to work initiative and these return to work plans, return to office. So what are things organizations and managers should be mindful of, Abby? It's it's really returning to office too soon and not meaning that, you know, we've got to stay remote forever, but meaning that there's a, a push to return to office without there being, you know, you know clear structures, strategies, processes in place um, for, for employees and for professionals who have been accustomed to working remotely, you know, for a little over two years now. Um, so are there processes as well for people to still continue working remotely or if they've got unique needs like we just talked about, like can they express those um, in this return to office plan? Um, and, and the other thing that we just really wanna highlight that organizations like really should be mindful of is one of the great benefits of the pandemic was from a, a talent perspective was that it normalized remote work, right? Like it, it made it, there was less stigma around it now um, that that was, that was a silver lining, but um, that's many moms are fearful that that stigma will come back with this push to returning to the office, right? That all of a sudden they're still at home, their counterparts might, you know, be back in the office. Will that hurt career advancement? So just being mindful even, and, and we'll talk about this a bit um, later in the conversation, but what does career advancement look like for those who are remote versus though in person? And how can we make sure that's really integrated into the return to office plans? Yes, I love that. And, and that really, you know, brings us to this point of, of career development. And there is that fear. I know, you know, I've felt it too. How do I showcase my abilities? How do I, you know, show what I'm able to do at work if, if I'm at home? And, and I think that it's so important to, to bring this to light. So, you know, career development is, is a driver for attracting moms to work, which I find super interesting because Normally, I think of it as more of, you know, being significant for current employees that are already hired rather than actually being a part of the recruitment and attraction piece. So what's driving this finding, Abby? Yeah, the, the pandemic has obviously played a strong role in how important and prominent, prominent this driver is. Um, and for career advancement, that, that's, that's a huge priority for moms because we found in one of our prior studies that, you know, 61% of moms felt like they had to pause career development efforts due to the pandemic, right? There was so much happening, so much, you know, mental, physical exhaustion um, that just occurred with the pandemic, lots of loss that, you know, they just had to put a lot of things on pause to care for those around them. Um, we found also that like moms of color were being more disproportionately impacted um, in their ability to advance their careers than other employee segments. And, you know, like on top of that all, we found that moms reported in one of our surveys that in terms of like the household and child care responsibilities, they were managing 91 to 100 percent of that within their own household, which is so much. So during that time period, we really saw moms and we heard them in our interviews saying, you know, we, we had to pause our, our careers. So now that they've got this newfound time with less virtual schooling, looking for organizations that prioritize that career development is really important. I think that's great. I, that's an astonishing number. 90 to, oh my gosh, I, I feel it. I, I get it. So um, Pam, maybe you can help us with what are some ways that organizations can really tap into this desire that moms have now more than ever have to develop and grow their career? 
That's a great question. You know, career development offer, offerings that help attract and retain mom talent really have to do with um, promoting training. So programs to support internal career moves, those can be online, preferably those could be things that are taped and watched, you know, at somebody's convenience, um, but really that support the next step in a career. Um, to that end, annual learning and development allowances, and particularly now as people are prone to a little bit more traveling, are, are really critical. Giving people a certain stipend that they can spend on um, if, um, education opportunities that they're most interested in can really be helpful. And sometimes those things are tangential to their jobs, but you know they're interesting topics and really um, su support learning opportunities. And then career planning and growth programs can't be overemphasized. So many times we hear from moms that just aren't sure what the next step to take is. They don't have a formal mentorship program. They don't have a formal mentor. But if, if an organization has some kind of career planning, some kind of growth program, some kind of indication of what they should be doing next if they want to prepare for particular types of careers, that can be really helpful. Um, the other thing is that organizations should also consider returnship programs. Uh, this is something that the, the Mom, Pro Mom Project helps organizations to do. They're a great opportunity, and it, it's a way that we're really excited to see organizations engaging with us. Um, there's an excellent pool of highly qualified women available that are eager to return to the workforce, um, and common biases often arise during the hiring process. There's often career gaps that have been either just deemed as disqualifying or uh, a strong ding to candidacy. Now, one of the things that we've learned is that moms who have stayed at home for any length of time are probably getting uh, great career uh, opportunities in terms of, you know, doing household management, um, doing multitasking, all sorts of things that could be emphasized on a resume. And as organizations learn to look beyond simply the resume for information, those gaps can really become opportunities. Uh, but in returnship programs, oftentimes organizations are really looking for people who are looking to return and are excited about it. We find where we've studied women in these programs, they tend to be much more engaged. Um, they rate much higher on employee satisfaction they're really eager to be in these roles and that can make a huge difference for uh, long-term retention as well. Yeah, the, the one thing I'll, I'll add to that too is um, one thing that organizations can, can do to really tap into this driver in addition to returnship programs is looking at non-standard, non non-typical candidates, right? Those that are upskilling and reskilling and, and trying to make those career pivots. Um, this candidate pool should really just be viewed as, as a gold mine um, by organizations. And this is something at, like at Work Labs are really excited about doing a lot of research with RISE. So the momproject.orgs um, not is a not for profit and RISE is focused on upskilling and reskilling uh, moms and women of color and um, just in working with with the RISE program and interviewing those candidates, it's so clear that um, these candidates are upskilling and reskilling. They're just like returnships. They're eager to, to make an impact in career development. It's something that they are driving for, that they, they want that in their workplace um, and they're gonna work really, really hard for it. Um, so this, this is something that really, if organizations wanna get around some kind of current biases and attracting great talent is not overlooking those that might not have directly applicable prior work experience, but are really eager to make a meaningful contribution. I love that. And talking about RISE is really a great segue into another key driver for attracting moms, which is diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, here at the Mom Project, we have employee resource groups, and I am the co-chair for our Latinx and Hispanic Viva ERG. It's been an honor of my career and, and just such a highlight. So Let's talk about how diversity and inclusion are, are felt by prospective talent. Pam? Yeah, uh, we work really close with the RISE program as well. We're always very excited to talk with moms who have either been through the program, um, who um, support the program. And in general, moms that we talk to really echo this sentiment said by one mom that diversity is extremely important and a workplace really needs to have a collective open mind. And that tends to be the general sentiment that we see. 
88% of moms that we've spoken to consider a company culture focused on diversity and inclusion as extremely important to where they want to be. Um, that culture is felt as early as just viewing a company's website all the way through the final round of interviewers. A talent look at the demographic makeup of the leadership is one of many indicating factors of an organization's real true commitment to DEI. And other factors that contribute to how prospective talent assess DEI is by asking or doing research into whether an organization has things like a focus on accessibility for employees and for, custo and for customers alike, and also programs dedicated to increasing uh, the representation of diverse groups, and then also goal setting and transparency around diversity metrics. That's extremely important and something that moms, women are asking about really as early as the interviewing stages. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, that makes sense. And yeah, you look at uh, a website when you're, you know, applying for a job and if no one looks like you, it's it's a little scary. Um, Victoria, what are you hearing specifically from talent on this topic? Are you seeing more jobs emphasizing DE&I on platforms like the Mom Project? Absolutely. I'm definitely seeing a lot more DE&I, um, not only from job descriptions, but from uh, moms and the candidates themselves. It's really a priority. It's one of the first questions that I'm asked. I love that. I think it's so important to have that. Abby, can you maybe share a little bit about what you guys are seeing as a threat to diverse and inclusive hiring? Yeah, happy to. And one of the, the biggest threats that I think we see in that, you know, Pam and I have talked about a lot, and we've done a lot of research on is ageism, which from our research, it, it begins as young as the age of, of 40. And it, you know, it appears to disproportionately impact women more so than men. Um, and, and even more so for those going through the job search process, you know, ageism can also happen when you're currently employed and already with an organization. But we do see that it, it's more prominent um, for those that are, are going through a job search and they feel like they experience it more during that time. Um, so, so really, you know, overcoming um, ageism and hiring practices and, and making sure that anyone involved in, um, in hiring at an organization is, is aware of what some kind of common ageist practices might be, what that can look like, right? That there's real education behind that um, to eliminate some of, of some of that ageism. And then, like we talked about earlier, just um, not, you know, being... Um, how, how you look at resumes, right? And, and making sure that we're not taking um, really qualified candidates out of consideration because they are upskilled or reskilled and their most recent work experience might not directly translate to that role. Um, that's another really key way to overcome some of those threats within the, the hiring um, scheme. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think those are all really great um, things for you know diverse hiring and, and creating an inclusive workplace. So I think a really hot topic right now is what benefits really matter to today's workforce and, and what doesn't, what's not important anymore. Um, Victoria, why don't we begin with you? What are you seeing specifically from the talent community here at TMP about this? Um, I'm seeing a lot more people kind of really, um, it's always been a very important topic, uh, mm -hmm. but a lot more emphasis on, you know, health benefits, definitely uh, benefits in regards to childcare, um, benefits of all sorts. It's one of the top questions that I'm always asked about. So it's definitely top of mind. Mm -hmm. sure. Pam, can you share a little bit more, you know, about the research side of things? Yeah, absolutely. You know, having supportive benefits and fair competitive compensation are always important. The, the pandemic really highlighted that many benefits now seem to be viewed as threshold requirements and anti to get in the game when considering an organization. So benefits and compensation are kind of a yes, no dichotomous, either yes, they meet the needs of my family or no, they don't. Um, if yes, the organization will be part of the mom's consideration when ranking organizations. If no, regardless of other perks and offerings, even the, you know, the ones that are nice to have, um, will really not uh, make the role come under consideration. So, and for many moms, working remote has become a threshold as well, a kind of skin in the game benefit when in the past, uh, prior to the pandemic, that really wasn't the case. And then in terms of compensation, I mean, it really comes down to paying people what they 
deserve, what they earn, um, especially in our competitive market to, to attract and retain talent today. Most frequently, our surveyed moms reported needing an 11 to 20% increase in comp to consider leaving current roles where they were already employed. So there's really a, a great emphasis on leaving a job where there's a significant increase um, in salary now. And for companies that maybe can't match the pay range of other organizations, um, that's when other offerings that are considered critical, like flexibility, come into play. And again, 88% of moms now consider flexibility as important as pay, whereas when we started doing this research back in 2017, it was closer to about 50%. So that's changed a great deal and can help level the playing field for um, employers who need great talents, but maybe can't yet pay quite as much uh, as bigger organizations. Wow, that's a significant jump. Very, very <laughs> telling of the times and, and what's going on. So so thank you for sharing that. Um, so with everything you know that we've kind of talked about and learned today, how does knowing what moms want help employers attract talent? Abby? Yeah, I think the one thing that we really want to emphasize today is that looking at moms and what moms want is a great indicator for what, you know, broader talent is going to be looking for in the near future. We think about, you know, moms were really the first ones to push and really advocate and want remote work. And now we're seeing that more widely across um, all employees, not just moms, not just parents. Um, so can, can we look at, can we really focus on what moms are desiring from their workplaces to feel empowered, you know, to feel included and productive? And can we apply that to um, the entire organization to, to attract talent? Just understanding that what moms want is, is, is really an indicator for the broader, broader talent landscape. Thank you. Um, okay, audience members. So I already saw some chats about wanting to have a Q&A session. So yes, this is our time to, to do that. So if there's any questions you have specifically for the panel about anything we've discussed today, Mom Project, Rise, all of those things, please feel free to drop them into the chat for Dr. Pam, Abby, and Victoria. Um, I, we will get those answered for you. And then in the meantime, we actually did have a few questions come prior to the event. So while you're getting those questions typed up, I'll go ahead and, and start with some of these questions. So the first one is, how can I, a talent member, participate in surveys and interviews like the ones talked about today? Oh, we love, we love that question. Um, we do a lot of studies. We really depend on our communities to, to volunteer for these studies. Um, we post them on social media, on um, LinkedIn, on, under Work Labs, under the Mom Project, under any other social uh, content that you'd see. We ask for volunteers for both qualitative, where we interview you and just have a conversational style interview, no set questions, all confidential. Uh, we'd love for you to participate in those as you see them pop up. And then we also routinely are fielding surveys to get representative samples and build our predictive models um, and have your voices being heard, always a lot of room for comments as well. So um, we absolutely appreciate participation of those. And uh, we're always posting for new studies that we have. Yes, please follow Mom Project. Please follow Work Labs. There's some really great studies being done by this team. So yes, participation, please. <laughs> um, another question. I haven't worked outside of the home in over three years. While I've worked for Temp for some great companies, I've never got hired on full time. How do I list this on my resume without looking like a job hopper? Great question. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and jump in and answer that. Um, from what I've seen, um, definitely, you know, list out um, the great companies that you work for and put the dates and put, you know, in parentheses, contract. Let folks know that it was a contract position. Um, and it, it's more than likely you definitely, it's not going to, to harm you in any way, shape or form. It's not going to say, oh my gosh, you know, you're a job hopper or anything. Um, it's just gonna clarify things, which is so helpful for the employer. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there's that reluctance of, oh no, like how do I say that I'm doing a contract? You're keeping your skills sharp. You're continuing to do work. Like that's wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, honestly, that can show high energy, that shows drive, it shows motivation. And it's not like it was years ago where people would expect to see 
uh, five years on your resume or minimally two years um, at one place. You know, people do move on. So the idea that somebody's showing them initiative and that they're getting those contract gigs really can be quite a plus on a resume. Absolutely. And, and to that, like we, we were seeing now that, you know, people are, are choosing contract. They have the option of full-time employment or, you know, working on a contract basis and working on a contract basis allows more, you know, sharpening of different skill sets, more variety, different types of industries. So um, it's something that, you know, is, is something people are opting into now. So the, the way it's perceived, yeah, is, is different now as well. Our next question. Okay, this one's from Erna. Are you seeing any specific asks around elder care as a benefit? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one, Erna. Um, I'll, I'll jump into this. You know, okay. I, I haven't seen that as a benefit. I haven't seen that, but that's that's a really great question, though. That is, and something that should be looked into. Well, yeah, we certainly, I, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Abby, go ahead. No, I think we were probably going to say the same thing, Pam, which <laughs> is that we certainly hear about it being something that is, is strongly desired from talent. We um, are doing interviews constantly with moms with you know professionals more broadly too to to conduct this research and you know not just caring for kids but you know caring for parents and and oftentimes doing that at the same time is something that's you know really burdensome and um that yeah they appreciate help from employers on that and i think you know best case we see employers moving more toward offering specific benefits that can be used <laughs> both for you know, elder care and for child care, for family care generally. I think the more that organizations allow people to choose what they use specific benefits for to suit their particular uh, life needs, the better off they and their employees are going to be. That's certainly how Work Labs is advising um, our clients now is to move towards that so that people can decide how to fit their unique needs. So elder care is certainly um, an area that's been underrepresented in organizations. Um, but as a benefit, we, we certainly, as Abby said, are seeing more and more people ask for that. I love that idea, Pam, of, of having it be a unique thing that you use for family care. That's, that's really great. Um, so from Su Suzanne, do return programs include older moms that have raised their kids? So what would we consider more of like that return ship? We see oh, definitely older moms that have raised their kids as part of returnships. Absolutely, um, you know we've had people you know who have said uh, they've been out of the workforce 15 years, sometimes a little bit longer, and they're so eager to return and have so much energy to return. And oftentimes, you know, when kids are out of the house, that's a great time to be coming back full force. And organizations are starting to see that that there's more time to devote to a job at that point. And um, and, you know, women are eager to get back into the game. So absolutely, older moms that have raised their kids make great candidates for returnship programs. And organizations are open to that as well. Lee Ann is asking to, uh, specifically to Victoria. Are you seeing general reluctance from moms about returning to work? Maybe due to shifted priorities or we're looking, we're looking before, but not as robustly right now. Um, that's a great question. Actually, Leanne, I am seeing more people who are wanting to get back into the workforce um, for wow. moms. Um, it is, you know, given that there are shifting priorities, um, they're actually looking more now uh, than ever because they are able to, to work from home and they see more opportunities out there uh, to work from home. Um, so it's definitely risen a lot more. Thanks. I think to, to Leanne's point, um, too, that while there's more moms looking for work, they're, maybe they're getting a little bit more picky, too, because yeah. they can. <laughs> you know, they're saying, hey, I'm, I'm just not willing to accept what I might have a few years ago. So maybe they're waiting a little bit longer and they're saying, no, I really need this. And it's great. I mean, it really is good to see people sticking with um, what they need to make them successful and happy at work. 
Yeah. And a lot of that stems from during the pandemic, we were hearing a lot of moms saying, like, I'd love to leave this workplace. It is not healthy for me. It's not supportive, but they weren't able to right? their primary breadwinners for their family. You know, it, it wasn't uh, the market that we have today when looking for a job. So a lot of women were staying put in dealing with workplace cultures that weren't supportive. And so now they're, they're looking again and, and like Pam said, being pickier because they have that clarity from how their workplaces often handled COVID and the pandemic and treating employees during that time. Yeah. They're picky because they can be. So that's good. I love that. Freya, shall we mention our gap and explain it in a cover letter or simply not mention it at all? Victoria, what are you seeing with this? Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to jump in. Um, You know, I I think that mentioning your gap um, is is totally fine. I've seen it on resumes where they say, you know, for the last five years, um, I've been doing this, whether I'm taking care of a loved one um, who's sick or or something else where they've actually listed what's been going on for the last five years. But I think absolutely um, mentioning it would be great. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in a cover letter. You can put it on a resume. At the mom project, we call those mom baticals. Oftentimes, and, you know, and there's a lot of skills that come with it, as we talked about earlier. And I think listing all the things that someone has done while they were having a gap in what we, you know, we have a report called return to paid work. We know everybody's working and particularly mm-hmm. mom. Um, so highlight some of the things that you were doing while you weren't doing paid work. It's, okay. it's extremely impressive. And that's some of what we're, yeah, and we're excited about kind of that education component that Work Labs and the Mom Project can can do within organizations, right? As highlighting like how to how to view those career gaps on resumes that just to that point, like view them as a mom baticle that where they were refining certain skill sets. So I think we're in a unique position too with Work Labs and the Mom Project to kind of facilitate some of that education um, and normalize those gaps too. Freya, great question. Okay, Katina, how can you leverage volunteer experience? This is a good one. I always wonder about this too. Victoria, do you see Absolutely. people like, oh, no, I'm like Victoria, our, our talent specialist? Like, what do you what do you see where people like list this, and how do you leverage that? So I've seen it in different ways. I've mostly seen it at the end of the resume, mm-hmm. kind of mentioning, okay, I've done this. Um, you know, I was a, a board member to an organization or I volunteered for a couple of years, it'd be great to expand on that. Kind of saying what exactly you did, um, you know, mentioning a couple of bullet points about it. Um, whether you put it at the end or let's say you uh, took some time off work and went ahead and volunteered for a couple of years, you could put that as well. Um, but it, it's very beneficial to put it on a resume. Awesome. Yeah, I think there's so many just transferable skills from, from what you do in, in volunteering that, that's mm-hmm. work-related. So I, I love that. Great answer, Victoria. TJ, does the Mom Project have an active mentorship program, and do you have to be a mom to work for the Mom Project? Work Labs team, I will let you take this one. I... I'm not currently a mom. So no, uh, you do not have to be a mom to work for the mom project. I mean, I think everyone that works here is um, really passionate about what we do. And that is something that really uh, empowers us to work as hard as we do and, you know, have this really great community and culture with where we work. Um, The mom project, you know, we do have, and maybe Angie, you can see more of this as as well, um, like our our rally and booster and boosty program so that you can receive some support or you can give support if you're in a position where, you know, you you feel like you have that capacity and you're wanting to give back. We do have that as well. And then, you know, within, for some of our research, we're really excited about doing more research on what successful mentorship matches really look like, right? So like Mm -hmm. a lot of organizations are realizing we need to be offering mentorship and it needs to be integrated in some of that like career development planning. But a lot of times those matches are just kind of randomized, right? Or just people are thrown together. Um, We're we're looking to do research to inform what successful matches look like so that really both the mentor and the mentee can gain the most from those relationships. I love that. And I've actually participated in our rally program um, as a mentor. And 
you know, I know we have a lot of organizations on the call today. So it, it, this is a call to action. Be a mentor if you have the capacity to do so. There are so many people in our community that are looking for support and that are looking for, um, you know, for some for, to another, you know, shoulder to lean on here. So we're all in it together. But yes, Abby, I also wasn't a mom when I started at the Mom Project, you know, three years ago. And I was like, how do I even convey this value proposition? I'm not a mom. And now I've had a baby through the pandemic, went to every doctor's appointment by myself, almost delivered by myself, just in the nick of time they let my husband in. But it was traumatic. So now I'm like, I have the best mom story. <laughs> so yeah, TJ, there's definitely resources out there for you. Jasmine, how does the Mom Project do management consulting for IED consulting to work with employers in getting buying to mom inclusive cultures? Well, certainly um, WorkLabs does uh, management consulting advisory services. Um, with clients, with uh, customers who come to us, and typically they're coming to us with specific issues that they want to tackle, things that have to do with diversity and inclusion efforts, equity, um, family-friendly leaves and policies, and just generally um, improving the workplace for their employees or specific issues that we're having. We'll work with them to build unique programs, to build predictive models that let them know where they can have the biggest impact um, on bottom line performance by improving the employee experience at any level. We start uh, by building unique models for each organization so that we're really tackling the, the issue head on. Um, and we, we build these models that are fairly robust. They'll hold up a couple of years across time and let them know where they can get the biggest return on their investment in terms of attracting and retaining new talent, uh, loyalty, uh, engagement and recommendation as a place to work as well. So the first step is really getting in touch with WorkLabs. And again, um, you can do that through WorkLabs.com or getting in touch with me or Abby. Um, and then we can have a, a general conversation about where next to go with that. Thanks, Pam. Okay, Deja, in my city, daycares have waitlisted for up to four years. Oh my gosh. Are companies expect, accepting negotiations to be hybrid or fully remote, remote due to childcare? Um, I'll step in for this one. Um, companies are, yes, they, there are some companies uh, that are accepting to be hybrid and there are companies as well uh, for fully remote. Uh, so it really depends on the company. Yeah, and, and we're actually actively doing a study collecting data on child care. Um, so if you go, excuse me, if you go to our LinkedIn, you'll see the link to take that survey there where we're trying to quantify this struggle that parents, that moms are experiencing, accessibility, cost of child care, the impact of, you know, like how work can impact child care experiences and vice versa. So uh, we are have, doing some active research on that topic, and hopefully we'll have more to share out um, in the future on that as well. Yeah, Deja, participate in the study. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Four years, that's, wow, I'm sorry about that. Karen, do you have any advice for single moms who need to not just be employed, but need to earn enough to create well-being? If she already has a master's degree, but had a long career break of 10 plus years, does she need to do an upskilling to earn a living wage? Wow. Well, Karen, I know that's a lot. And uh, I raised my own son as a single parent as well. So I understand um, what you're saying there. Um, it, you know, in terms of the degree that you hold, it, it really depends whether you're looking to go into a different field. If you're looking to reskill, let's say, into a tech field and you're not currently in it. We have, um, we were talking about this earlier, our RISE program that helps uh, women, moms, particularly moms of color, reskill into new careers um, and then helps them in terms of finding jobs. Um, they're not, uh, they're, they're, they work around mom's schedule to help them find um, and reskill for new positions, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, you don't always have to upskill I, I don't want to be negative about that. It really just depends on what you've done in the past and, and the skills that you have currently in terms of relevance for jobs that you might want to have. But I will say that sometimes upskilling programs can be, 
you know, six week programs, any, you know, anywhere from six weeks to six months, so oftentimes they won't take as much time as one might imagine and can be helpful to have. Um, we've had quite a few people who got jobs while they were going through the reskilling programs. Um, and actually their employer, new employers were really supportive of those programs. So that's another way to go as well. Thank you, Pam. Okay, Candy, how likely are companies to adopt new or modern hiring practices and screening algorithms? I'm finding some organizations may be behind the curve and quickly disqualify candidates without considering the whole candidate and their needs. That's a great question. I can start. Um, yeah, work, work know, labs, I think. Yeah, we, we can start. Um, you know, companies are really all over this, the spectrum with this. And um, some are going to have more modern practices and others, you know, it might just be taking a bit more time. I think one thing that we're really optimistic in engaging with companies in that cult consultative capacity, but then also through the research that we're doing is that during the pandemic, you know, that really highlighted a need to refine these practices, to be more inclusive in, you know, in the hiring practices, in how we view resumes. So the pandemic really seemed to be um, a turning point for organizations that might have been lagging to at least recognize that, hey, it's time we need to step up. That that learning curve of understanding, you know, what that means and what that looks like, that might take some time. But I think we're optimistic at what we're seeing from our perspective in terms of um, action that's starting to occur these last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. As companies want to um, step up their DE and I efforts as they want to attract and retain more women in the workplace. They really are starting to take a look at things that go uh, well beyond traditional resumes and cover letters. And we're really encouraging that at work labs as well. And um, the companies who have worked with us are finding great success in doing so. So I have great hope that that, that trend will continue. I hope so too, Pam. That was great insights, Abby. Thank you. I think we have a couple more questions. Okay, this is the last question. Um, so recommendation on best to, best places to reach moms looking to re-enter the workforce from Katie. Victoria, where, what are you seeing here? Well, first of all, the mom project. <laughs> <laughs> yes, shameless plug. <laughs> TMP, here you are. <laughs> um, also, you know, I, I think that um, you've got LinkedIn, you have so many um, other job searches out there. Um, there, you know, I think the Mom Project is unique that it is really, um, really, really focused on moms that are out there. Um, but I would say, you know, there aren't really any others that just, you know, kind of hone in on moms. Um, but yeah, there, there are, you know, so many out there, just general ones. I think taking a look at each company and the benefits that they provide um, in regards to childcare and things of that sort um, is a really great way to start. Thank you so much, Victoria. Yes, shameless plug, Mom Project. Obviously, you're already here. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much for being a part of this panel and talking about your research. And thank you to the amazing audience for listening, your participation, your questions. Um, thank you so much for, for being with us and taking time out of your day. Uh, if there's any further questions for Dr. Pam, Abby, Victoria, myself, please jump over to the sessions portion of the event platform. So it's on the left-hand side of the screen. You can join the talent networking room to chat with Victoria and Abby about current trends or if you're interested in joining the Mom Project community or go to the employer networking room to chat with Dr. Pam and myself about how employers can work with the Mom Project to get these talent trends about these talent trends and how you can put them to work in your organization. So thank you again. We're going to be sharing a recording of this webinar and the full talent trends report on Monday. So have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much.